So yeah, hi, from my side, my name is Sebastian Daschner, born and raised in Munich, Germany. And funny enough, this is actually, believe it or not, the first time that I'm in the Netherlands. I never made it so far. And um, I arrived yesterday and could walk around Amsterdam a little bit, and it's beautiful. That was definitely a huge mistake to yeah, wait that long. So yeah, I might, I might come back <laughs> if, I, if I may. Um, yeah, I'm doing a lot of Java enterprise and enterprise things in general. I'm self-employed. In, in Germany, so I'm a Java consultant and trainer and author, uh, whatever you call it. I happened to uh, wrote a book last year about modern Java enterprise development, and I do a lot of conference speaking and training workshops for companies to help them build better enterprise software. And then all kind of Java titles, Java champion, and so on and so forth. And oh, I help standardizing the future of Java enterprise in what was the JCP in the past and will be Jakarta EE in the future. So that's, I think, very, very exciting to be part of a committee that, that standardized technology. And yeah, about this title, Bulletproof Resilient Java Enterprise Applications for the Hard Production Life. Yes, I like titles that ask for trouble. And what about that? So in Java Enterprise, that API is quite well known, and it's very productive, I would say, to build um, enterprise applications that specifically are targeted on your business logic, basically like solving your business problems and implementing them. But that's somehow not enough to run them in production, because production life is hard, production life is crucial, and that is actually the ultimate verification whether everything works as expected, right? So everybody can write some hello world and then just run it and ship it, maybe also in, in containers, Docker, Kubernetes, right? That's kind of easy, but it's a different story to make it bulletproof, to really build resilient applications that somewhat target for production. And this is what we will we'll talk about um, today. So what I want to show you is a lot of live coding. So first of all, I want to um, cover like Java EE mechanisms that come with the standard or that are somewhat extensions to Java Enterprise. Because I hear quite often like, oh yeah, it's not really possible to integrate this and this and this into Java EE because it's not supported or not supported yet. And I want to show you what extensions are there, like open source projects or MicroProfile, if you heard of that, that well, builds upon our Java Enterprise applications. And as a second thing, I want to show how to implement all these concerns with service meshes, specifically Istio, and why that is a very well-suited technology to build upon our Java E stack. So basically, we will have a stack that is somewhat um, future-ready, even for the next uh, years, and that allows us to implement all these concerns, all these resiliency concerns. And in order to do so, I will um, live code two applications, or basically take two Java Enterprise applications and make them somewhat resilient. Um, why two applications? Because one is boring, right? And we want to have some communication, especially if we want to have some service meshes, right? And you probably know I like coffee, right? So in the, in the past, I did a lot of examples with coffees and, and coffee shops, and then I figured, oh, a uh, coffee shop being the Netherlands that might make some misconceptions. So I'm doing another example. I'm talking about an instrument craft shop instead. So I'm building up an instrument craft shop that builds, well, instruments, and it uses then, well, an external system to craft these instruments, right? And the external system that I'm using will be a MakerBot system. So you maybe know these 3D printers. So it's not actually a very well-made, uh, well-crafted, craft shop, but a very cheap one that only 3D prints your instruments. But anyway, that's going to be the example for us. And then, well, we want to add some resiliency concerns. So first of all, let me quickly walk through a little bit of uh, code and two examples that I prepare for you. I will build a Java E8 application, or basically two of them, that is built with Maven, Java E8 API um, deployed on I use Open Liberty a server, application server that supports that, and that is, of course, packaged into a Docker container, and that will later on run in a Kubernetes and Istio cluster. So this one is the first, that is the so-called instrument craft shop application. 
that basically allows us to build well, instruments, so it offers an API to a client. The client can go there via HTTP and sort of order some instruments. So we will have a JAXRS resource, basically, that allows us to, to print some instruments, something like this. And, well, this is quite straightforward for now. So if I briefly uh, walk through that, then you will see we didn't add some resiliency concerns yet. So that is basically plain Java E code. So I defined some, um, some JAXA res uh, resources here. I do not talk about pooling um, and stuff like that. So this will uh, come in a second. And what we're doing here, we will just um, asking our MakerBot external system to print an instrument synchronously. And what that uh, does, it um, communicates with our second external system, with the MakerBot system that we call. That can be connected to using DNS. That will later be done using a service discovery in Kubernetes, so we can specify this MakerBot logical service name that you see here, and then we access the second system. And that's basically it here for that system. The second system, the MakerBot system, is even easier. It basically accepts um, our request here and then says, yeah, that's fine, thank you, come back later. And this is how we do the communication. So not much for now. Um, in order to build and run this, what we're going to do is, well, we first of all build it using Maven, and then we package it into a Docker container, and then we can run it um, already locally. So, for example, we build it into an instrument uh, craft shop image with, um, with a private Docker rep uh, repository to later on being able to pull it in our Kubernetes cluster. So, for now, that's not very bulletproof and not very resilient because we didn't add anything else rather than just our business logic and rather than plain usage of Java E APIs, right? So a few concerns that we might want to add is the whole resilient ap approach means, well, first of all, what, what means being resilient or being bulletproof, even more buzzwordy? Well, first of all, don't crash. Yeah, thank you, Captain Obvious. So that's already helpful if we do not crash our applications. Um, but more precisely, adapting to errors. So basically, if something, some small trip, some small error happens from a client request or from circumsta some circumstances, from some misconfiguration, do not crash the whole server already or the whole application. So, so that is one thing. Um, once we deploy it later on to our container orchestration, we also see that uh, Kubernetes, for example, supports us in these concerns. For example, we can say, if something goes down, then please immediately start up the next instance. So that is already a resiliency concern, where we can say, okay, we want to uh, be more resilient in, in, term, um, in case something crashes, and then just start up a new instance, for example. And then a few other things, for example, taking a step, a st a step back. That goes uh, together with a, a concept that we'll see um, called a back pressure. So basically, once we utilize an application or an external system, means being nice. If that system is already screaming under load, then maybe taking a step back, take it easy, and not utilize it further to not crash it. And we will see how we can do that. And also somewhat uh, what is called being conservative in what you do and being especially liberate in what you accept. For example, if you call an external system and you get some response back in JSON, something like that, don't be overly strict with saying this JSON format, this response doesn't apply to the standard, right? Because there are a couple of fields that I don't understand and this is not the standard that we documented in the company, right? if you can work with the data you get. So basically, be nice to each other, be liberal in what you accept, saying, okay, if that response that doesn't look quite like it should, like I would expect it, but anyway, I can work with that data. For example, I, it has all the required fields, and that's fine for me for my use case right now. Then I just accept it, and then I just look, not overly break, break the system, break the communication. These are just a few introduction concepts or what to think about in terms of being resilient. And then a first other uh, concept, quite simple one, timeouts, especially when using network connections. 
So that, it sounds quite, uh, quite simple. Always use timeouts. We're quite used to that right now. But depending on how you use um, Java Enterprise APIs, that might not be the case that you implicitly define timeouts. For example, if you use the Jaxtras client. That's, for example, a specific to the implementation. Let's have a look here. What do we do? We build a so-called client, and then we have a web target. And once we basically call that system and send a request, what we're doing, we're posting something here. And once we execute it, well, depending on the implementation, that might not define a timeout, which is super bad, right? Because then you might lock, um, and then in the worst case, you block infinitely. And then that threat is gone because it waits forever. And then your threat pool might be limited, and so on and so forth. And at some point, you can create a deadlock using this situation. So always try to define timeouts in Java um, Enterprise and JAXRS 2.1 then has been added uh, with a connect timeout and a read timeout. Let's say we have a connect timeout of two seconds and a read timeout of something else for seconds, of course, depending on your use case, wherever you, um, your applications run, depending on the data center and your um, experiences for that, which already makes the whole thing a lot of uh, safer, much safer to, to run it for all of the client connections. Um, same is true for databases, right? So always try to define timeouts, and if something um, fails, well, we can retry later on. It's much better to, to send an error rather than to being locked. Um, speaking of database con uh, connections, the same is true there. There have been some implementations where once a connection crashes to your database, that connection is basically dead. But also, once you retry it, you kind of reuse the same connections. Have you had that error? And, and then basically you need to restart the whole server just because your database failed once, which of course is somewhat a bad idea. So try to make that resilient. It's fine to crash once, but then, well, retry, try again. A few other concepts where I now want to introduce um, more extensions for Java Enterprise. For example, Circuit Breaker. That is quite known as well for now. Let's do a quick poll. Who has used Circuit Breakers? Hands up. Okay, yeah, quite a few, at least. Um, what does that mean? It's quite similar to the circuit breaker in, in a house, like electrical engineering. So basically, prevent actions that are doomed to fail anyway and prevent further damage, right? What happens if you build out all of the um, circuit breakers in your house? Well, that's a bad idea. Then something else burns down. It doesn't mean that then your application works. No, there is something going on. There's something wrong anyway. So you can just um, detect the failure and, and fail fast anyway. So it basically means detecting failures or sometimes slow responses and saying, okay, this now failed too much. We just um, skip it. We do not try again. We immediately fail. And that's also important immediately because this saves you a lot of, a lot of time that you would other, otherwise spend waiting. Uh, a little bit more on that uh, further on. In order to integ uh, integrate that, what we could do, there have been a few Java Enterprise extensions. Uh, for example, one uh, famous one by Adam Bean called Breaker, where you basically, always what you do in Java Enterprise, you define either a CDI extension or an interceptor, and then you have an own interceptor binding that basically wraps the call to your bean and say, okay, now we uh, detected too many exceptions or we detected a too, um, a too slow execution over time, and then we just uh, kill it immediately and return something else. That is possible. You can implement that uh, yourself in not too much code, but we don't want to reinvent the wheel all over again. So what we do, and I prepared um, something for you, of course, is that we will use um, microprofile, um, specifically microprofile fault tolerance. So there is, where is it, here? There is, I don't want to call it standard, but a project uh, of microprofile that adds uh, micro, uh, well, fault tolerance and a few of these concerns, for example, circuit breakers to your application. And what it does is quite um, straightforward. For example, Let's say we want to go to that um, maker bot and say, if that fails so and so often, that is the client connection, then please do not retry, but just fail immediately. And that is added by adding the annotation circuit breaker. That's it. Okay, well, we can 
I can configure that a little bit more. What it does, if you um, read the documentation, it basically tries to call that, um, tries to execute that functionality, that method, and then if it fails so and so often, it will immediately um, immediately throw an exception or immediately call an alternative method, execute an alternative functionality for a given window. And that um, can be configured within that annotation. So you're basically saying, how often do I want it to, to fail or want it to not fail until um, that circuit breaker is tripped and is open then? So basically until that is open and will throw the error or execute um, the default method. That can all be configured in that annotation here. What else can be done? So in case the circuit breaker is open, so if it's tripped, then it will throw an exception that is also defined in MicroProfile. So each and every time it's executed then. Or you can say, I want to have a fallback functionality where you could specify another class and another method that of course has to have the same signature as this print instrument method and will be executed instead for that duration of the window while the circuit breaker is open. And then after that window, you will try again once, so it's sometimes called half open, and if it then succeeds, well then it's fine, then it's closed, then it's all good again, or if it fails again, then you immediately um, open again. And that is another uh, functionality to specify that. We will leave it here for now, so basically that would, um, after I think 20 attempts per default, just open the circuit breaker, trip it, and immediately return an error, error rather than trying it up um, many, many times. By the way, do you have any questions during my talk or any questions in general? I always try to encourage you to ask as much as, as possible or maybe at the end of the talk, whenever you, you like. Then next thing, another concept of being resilient. Bulkheads is also quite a practical concept. It originally comes from ships. And ships are separated into bulkheads that can fail immediately. And once you hit the iceberg, then only one crashes. And hopefully that ship can still run if it's not uh, called unsinkable or something. And because other bulkheads are still there, are still open. Or for us, for enterprise application, if we have multiple functionalities, then Maybe one functionality can be utilized right now, can be screaming under load, can even crash, and we still want the other functionality to still run. And um, in terms of that, we want to prevent cascading errors. So basically, once we hit one functionality, we do not want the whole application to go dark just because of that. So the rest stays functional. What does that mean for Java Enterprise? And most of the um, time that is, uh, tackles uh, threat pooling, so threat pools, because we want to have, or should have in that regard, multiple threat pools in order to, well, avoid deadlocks throughout the whole application or in, um, in order to um, avoid heavy utilization or starvation throughout the whole application. So basically, if we hit one endpoint that defines its own, um, its own threat pool, then the rest of the application should stay sane. And how we implement that in Java Enterprise is, that f is as follows. There are a couple of um, possibilities. The one I used and liked the most is another um, extension by Adam Bean called uh, Porcupine. Um, that name is uh, quite funny. It's the, I think, the English version of, of Hystrix, of the animal uh, Porcupine. So Hystrix is Latin, I think, the name, and Porcupine is, is English, I guess. And that comes here with the Maven declaration. And what it does, it adds an extension that you basically quite easily can define your own, well, threat pool executor. So something similar to your own managed executor service. As you might know, in Java Enterprise, you must not start your own threats. That's very important. Your threats should be managed, must be managed by the application container. Don't start your own threats. But now we kind of want to start or create our own thread pools. That also should be managed and configurable and so on and so forth, so you have to add this extension. That is possible, it's not quite straightforward. You uh, have to have, I think it's called thread pool factory, something like that. And then you basically can add CDI producers or else to create these kind of things. So how do we integrate that? 
Basically, what we want to have here, it of course depends on your business logic, what you actually want to place into these separate bulkheads. What we want to have here is saying, create the instrument that use case, that functionality should be in its own bulkhead, in its own thread pool, and get instruments, basically reading, should be another one. And that is very important, especially for um, JAXRS or for everything that involves HTTP requests, because how application uh, containers usually work is that you send in a request from the client, and that is bound to an HTTP request thread. Sometimes you can um, also see that in the log files if you, um, if you lock the threads and then it will tell you which request thread it was. And if you start some asynchronous process, then it will have a totally different name. So it's not a request thread anymore. And that's exactly the point because these request, uh, request threads are of course pooled. And once and there's one pool, a single one for the whole application or for the whole server context. And once that is exhausted, then it's done, right? It's gone. You can't fire any other request. Doesn't matter for which functionality. So that is quite important that we untangle that, that we basically um, decouple the thread pooling here from our functionality. And how that usually works is, um, and that is an enhancement called um, asynchronous um, resources, asynchronous JAXRS resources. Um, there are a couple of ways how to accomplish that. The nicest way available since Java 8 is returning a completable future and saying, okay, I don't give you the list of instruments, but a completable future of list of instrument, which doesn't interest us at all because um, in version of control, we don't call that method. That method will be called by the container. I don't care, honestly. The container then knows, okay, if that's the case, then it will take the um, request thread and suspend it, call that, um, call that functionality, execute that, however it was created within that thread pool or that executor service, and then later on um, resume that client connection from that request um, thread. The good thing about that is then that the thread is still available to handle other requests, basically. So we do not um, utilize our overall request thread pool because that one is limited for the overall application, and that's quite important. So how that works is that we say completable future, supply async, any functionality using this. Don't leave it like that, very important, because supply async can define an own executor. And usually we want to have an executor service, and that's quite important because otherwise, like this, it will use, um, I think, per default, a, fi a fixed thread pool or something like that, but a customly um, created one by the JVM, which is not managed by the server. So this is bad. Rather do this, we define, please use the managed executor service that I just injected over there, and then it's good. This is an asynchronous uh, JAXRS resource, and then we will not exceed all the request threads. The same is true for this guy here. We can also um, define this return type for the response return type, and just saying, okay, in this case, please return a completable future of supply async and so on and so forth. Of no, Help me this one, and then craft the instrument. Um, oh no, in uh, other case, sorry, I need to run async because that one is actually void. And then seeing, saying, please apply the functionality of, of this guy, return no content, or exceptionally, in case there is some exception, return this. Agree? Yes? Okay, so what did I do? I basically say, please execute that functionality within, very important, why didn't you complain? That's the correct way. Within the correct executor, the executor service, the one that is managed by the application server, that guy is a void method, so I have to call, sorry, I have to call run async, and then basically what happens, either say response, no content, two or four status, or saying it was an exception, internal server error with some header information, whatever. That also uses this. What is the, uh, well, story that's not, uh, not so nice about that is now we didn't apply the bulkhead pattern yet. 
that is just asynchronous Jaxa REST resources. That's the first step towards that. But how that works is, well, let's try it out. We built this application. And oh, of course, I did something wrong. Why didn't you complain? <laughs> I think I did. Yeah, that's the one, right? So we will build this application and then run it, and then basically utilize the application and see what happens, see what's the, what's the challenge with this. Um, so what we'll do first, let me see if that Docker thing still runs. Yes, our MakerBot um, still runs, so we will build our application. Now version two, another version, so these ones don't collide, and then we can run it, um, well, in an own network, so the two actually can communicate with each other. This is basically a workaround to the fact that we later on want to run it in a Kubernetes example. Um, so now I just run two Docker applications, um, Docker containers locally, which is quite boring for now, but for the test is easier. Why? Because if I deploy to the cloud and then I run a heavy load test, then probably the network breaks down or something. This is not a good idea, right? Especially for a conference. Um, ask Bertian, you can still uh, you can tell a funny story about that. So we will run this um, here, and then basically what we can um, say: um, please ask for the instruments. Okay, let's do this. So you can actually see what I'm typing. First of all, we want to ask the application localhost 9082, please give us the instruments, right? So we call this instrument craft job and ask for, let's say, this resource. Please give us the instruments. Um, resources. Instrument craft job resource instruments. Right? And then we get, yes, HTTP, OK and so on and so forth. And then basically what, um, what happens is if I would like to, so long story short, if I would like to um, call the, another, uh, the other resource at the same time, well, it will not work because um, now I basically I'm utilized, uh, utilizing the first thing. So I could call that one, that works fine, but if I now would like to call, well, like to create an instrument at the same time, that is using the same request uh, thread pool. So how should we do that properly? Um, the Porcupine, this extension by Adam Bean, basically says create your own executor service for each bulkhead and then use that one instead of the managed one. How that works is you inject something. You inject um, a so-called dedicated um, thread pool, dedicated executor service that is called instrument, um, let's say, read. Executor service. Well, read executor. And another one for, I will now call them write. So just a different one. Right, executor, we don't need that. And then we define these to provide a completable future, to basically back as the thread pool or thread creator. Um, this one is read, this one is write, to then create what we want. So how are, the, uh, how are these configured? It's basically, that is the configuration for this executor. Um, that is also using Java Enterprise Standard, so it specializes executor configura uh, configurator that comes with this uh, Porcupine extension. Uh, what it does is we want to create our own configuration for this with a certain queue capacity and a policy how to, be, um, how to react once um, the whole thing is full, once the whole thing is utilized, and so on and so forth. And how, and then we first of all want to have different ones, that's important. And how do we configure that? And this is now somewhat a, a question for, for the next concept, basically applying back pressure. So that is a question how to react if your application is under load. <laughs> Sorry, did I touch the, well, everybody awake? Okay. There's a question how to react, how to react when you're under load or uh, under noise. And the question is, 
whether you want to meet your SLAs, your service level agreement, or rather wait. Right? So basically you're saying, I'm offering my client a service level agreement of in 99 point so many nines percent answering within 200 milliseconds or whatever, or else. Right? Or it's better to provide some response in, let's say, 400 milliseconds, but at least the client will get something. So the client will have to wait longer, but at least there is a response rather than an error. That's more like a business question. But in most of the cases, you want to actually meet your SLAs or, important, fail fast. So if not, then at least fail fast. Because what happens is, let's say you have a bunch of um, applications within your system, and you already know that one system is utilized heavily, that that system will probably, meet the, uh, prob probably not meet the SLA, not the 200 milliseconds, then you can immediately reject the request, not after 200, but immediately, to give the application the chance to maybe connect against another one and still meet the SLA within that second request. So that's the idea behind that. And very important, you want to fail fast, you want to fail immediately once that basically is the case to give, give it a chance to retry. Of course, depending on whatever your application does. Sometimes you cannot do anything else, then it might be better to wait. But this is now the question how to configure that pooling. So two things, in my case, I will um, use the reject policy. So basically, once you connect, it says, no, thanks, come back later. Immediately return with um, uh, service unavailable, for example, HTTP status code. And the second thing is how to basically configure that thread pool. So there is one um, calculation that you could do saying you want to meet, let's say, 200 milliseconds of time, and you have a usual average response time of your service. So what you do, you take your SLA and divide it by the average response time that you have, and then you have the number of workers or number of um, threads in the pool plus queue size that you want to configure. Why? Let's say you have 200 milliseconds and an average response time of 20 milliseconds. So what you do, you want to have 10 slots available. That is the maximum queue size or maximum um, utilized thread pool size plus queue size that you want to wait in order to meet your SLA. If it's bigger, then quite statistically, there's, an, it's not, there's a non-zero chance to not meet your SLA, right? Because then you have to wait for more than 10 times 20 milliseconds. That's kind of the idea. There's uh, a lot more to that than, than I can ex uh, explain um, right now, but this is one basically starting point how you could configure that queue size. And in this case, with that executor configuration, you um, start with the think number of uh, processors available in the system plus the queue capacity in this case. So that would be uh, queue capacity, capacity for, a, uh, for four in this um, bulkhead for the read um, pattern here. And that is um, utilized within that executor. Any questions for that? So these are the things to keep in mind, especially to combine this with asynchronous JAX REST resources. Otherwise, you have another limiting factor, which is your request thread pool. So it doesn't help if you apply that somewhere in your code. Well, depends on the use case, how, the, how that looks. But um, if you have a fully fledged example from it starts with one request, it does something, and it returns that request, then it's important that you keep these uh, request uh, thread pools in mind. So let's, let's build this for now. And yeah, of course, it does not. Um, oh, that's the wrong shell, actually. That was not a Maven project. So let's do a Maven clean package here and then rebuild the Docker container and then run it again locally. So I can um, actually, this is uh, easier for you, so I can show two things at once. I can show the creation of an instrument and then utilizing that um, the second res uh, resource as well without, without us uh, utilizing the request thread pool. So let's start this up. What we can have is um, we create a new guitar, for example, here. So similar to, to what we had before, let's ask the system, local host. What we're doing, we pay, uh, we're posting a new JSON re um, request to that 
to that resource in order to create, in our case, a guitar. And hopefully that also responds with two or four no content. How often do they do that? Oh, maybe let's add some sleep. One second. So this is the case here. And also we want to utilize our system. And there are a couple of um, ways to do that. I will um, use, for now, Apache, uh, Apache Bench. That's one way um, of just simply utilizing a system. There are a couple of uh, ways to do that. Gatling tests, Fortio, or brute force with while true, whatever you, you prefer. That is one, um, one way here. To simply utilize it here with now 10 concurrent uh, requests to do get requests for the instrument. Um, for the instrument um, res uh, resource, and you, st uh, you see still the left one, well, works. So in order to utilize this a little bit more, so you see actually the difference. Um, let's have another while true here that actually just queries the instruments. Maybe a little bit faster and maybe without the, the overall response here. And now if we increase this, you see it will immediately reject it. So that's the point uh, with that. Let's do a few more requests. So now this is fully uh, under load. And you will also see from the response of, uh, of the benchmark that there are a lot of failed responses. But still, you're for um, most of the cases, depends now on the actual configuration, I didn't really calculate that, your response time is still very reasonable. That was uh, like 200 milliseconds or uh, 250 for 95 percent. So your response time is still me meets the SLA, whatever you configure here, and everything else will be rejected immediately. So basically don't care because it will be too slow. Rather than what else you would see that the right window moves very slow because you're waiting for each and every request, because you're waiting for, for example, a new slot in the request uh, thread pool for a new execution there, and this would not help you much. So that is the back pressure um, plus the bulkhead pattern applied here. So that is basically back pressure. Again, it's a question of how to configure it, a question of, how, um, of configuration, and First one, bulkheads, it's usually a question of how do you configure and um, which thread pools to use. And that can be done via this extension. All right, any questions for now? Then we go to a slightly different topic to basically realize similar things. Service meshes, most of, uh, it, uh, most of all Istio. So why this? I now showed you a couple of extensions that you can add to Java Enterprise in order to realize these concerns with, well, the technology itself, right? To implement this using our stack, using our application, so it will be part of it. And if you deploy that Docker container, all of these resiliency concerns will already be implemented there, right? Now, service meshes are a somewhat different approach. And service meshes, what they do, a service mesh is basically a mesh of multiple microservices, of multiple microservice deployments, in our case usually Docker containers or containers in general that run in some container orchestration cluster. And then we can, and that's the interesting thing, transparently add a few technical cross-cutting concerns that are required without changing the application. Which concerns? For example, resiliency, or telemetry data, or load balancing and routing and, stuff, uh, and such, or authentication and authorization, without changing the application, which makes it quite simpler or simpler for us application developers, because if you maintain a lot of um, our microservice deployments, you do not have to add this into our stack for each and every container and for each and every application, basically. You, um, in other words, say the application can stay quite simple, just basically connect against HTTP, and the service mesh will take care of that. So how does this work here? Quite in simple terms. What we have here, our first um, 
system, and the second one, an instrument craft job and a MakerBot. How does that look if we deploy it to Kubernetes? So we have a service here. Let's say this one is a service, and that one is a service, instrument craft job and MakerBot, and that runs a pod. Right? A pod, in our case, runs one container, the actual um, instance, our actual application that runs there. And the pod, well, connects to the service of the MakerBot and then will talk to the other instance and get a response back, direct call and communication. Okay, quite simple. What do service meshes add here now? It's a little bit different here. In a service mesh, basically what we want to have, these um, technical cross-cutting concerns that are added without changing our application. So basically what we're doing is, quite similar how Java Enterprise works, how the application container does it. We add a proxy that runs in the same pod. So we add a so-called sidecar container to our main container, that is shown in purple and green. That will, will act as a proxy and basically intercept all of the connections for us. And that can then add a few more concerns. For example, we want to connect against our instrument craft shop from the client but now what we're actually doing, we're talking to the proxy, and the proxy will call the main container of our instrument craft shop, so our actual application. And if our application now wants to call the external system, without its knowledge, it will actually talk to a proxy too. And that will talk to another proxy of the other service, of the other part there, that also then later on will serve the response. So now you're basically communicating over this mesh that you build up of, uh, over this mesh of proxies and main containers to well be able to intercept and enhance your communication. So how is that implemented? Using sidecar containers that run in the same pod and that share the same network. And then you can use black magic such as IP tables and um, routing to change the routing of, um, of your connections without changing the application. And then, of course, add a few more concerns in your proxy containers. So a proxy container can then log something, emit uh, monitoring data, add tracing, and all kind of things that help you. Or it also can add resiliency concerns, basically saying, oh, you want to have this connection? Well, no, I want to kill it immediately, circuit breaker, for example. Or I want to add a, tri uh, a timeout, and then basically adding timeouts on both sides without the knowledge of your application. And for your application, it would then behave as if the external system gave that response to you. So it's, well, a proxy in between, right? And then you can do all kind of things. So let me quickly introduce um, how that works. So we have a deployment. And basically, first of all, we need some container orchestration for us, or we should have some container orchestration that makes it easier. Um, I use Kubernetes here. So the, these are the Kubernetes resource definitions for a service that is called instrument craft job, and of course for a deployment. That, by the way, implements a few other uh, resiliency concerns. For example, if our application fails, our pod goes dark, that replica, that um, replica set internally, will immediately create a new one to satisfy the number of replicas here. If we want to scale up to two, four, five, and more replicas, it's also possible by this definition, by this descriptive approach of specifying how our environment should, um, should look, and then just sending it against the cluster. So here, basically, we want to run our image, our application, the instrument craft shop version one. I run the version one here. Um, to not add uh, the Java Enterprise uh, resiliency approaches that would otherwise in the test like um, interfere with that. But actually, they, they work um, well to, uh, together quite nicely. For example, if your application already defines a timeout and your service mesh also defines one, well, the timeout that is smaller will ultimately be triggered. It's different with other approaches such as retries that also can be added in Java Enterprise or service meshes, basically saying, oh, it fails, I immediately want to retry without throwing an error. And then it takes longer and you have a retry, and of course, if you specify both, then you basically have, um, well, um, a, a, a bigger number of, of retries. 
in general. Okay, so let's stop this um, again for now, and we actually want to deploy it on our um, cluster. So what I have here is um, Kubernetes and Istio cluster. Istio.io, you can check that out, is um, one of the service uh, mesh technologies, and I think for now the most uh, widely used one. And what I have is an Istio cluster that was uh, created by Google uh, Cloud's Google Kubernetes engine that is, uh, works quite nicely, so you can create your own clusters. There are templates uh, for that, and I have one that runs here with uh, three nodes that I just created um, today. Um, which is, I think, um, empty. Oh, okay, works. Um, Kubernetes get services. Yeah, there's nothing running there and no pod running. That's great. So we want to run our application now. Um, who of you has used Kubernetes? Hands up. Okay, quite a few. If you have any questions, then feel free to ask. Um, we want to add our deployment that basically says, Add everything I specified there, a service, a deployment, and a so-called ingress to access our application for this application and also, of course, for the MakerBot. Same thing here, and then what we have, well, pods that are currently starting up and services and a few other things such as ingresses to access our workload from externally. What is interesting here is that guy. It's currently starting up, so it's not ready yet, but what does it mean? We have two containers in that pod. Two containers, one is ready yet, the other one isn't. Why two? I only specified one. Well, that's now the sidecar injection that comes with Istio, so Istio will inject that proxy container without needing us to specify it, which is um, quite helpful. And once that's up and running, I show you a few more resiliency concerns, so this is what this talk is about not just about Istio, how that is added to enhance our applications without changing our code. So let's see, how long does, uh, does that take in order to start up? It's hopefully done soon. And then, well, we can do something um, sophisticated. How that works is we are, well, encouraged to add some so-called uh, routes um, to define some um, default routing within our service um, mesh Oh, that was, that was too much already. Like half of my demo is already there to add um, a delay and a timeout, basically. So how that looks is that we can specify some rules. Basically, per default, it's saying that application goes to the second one. That is always the case per default. But now we can specify a few more things. For example, saying that rule, that route, should have a timeout, for example. That is then applied between these two services between these two applications, timeout of one second, for example. Or also, what we can do is define a few more things. Um, for example, an instrument craft shop circuit breaker. Um, STO, circuit breaker destination policy, instrument craft shop. What it does, it's, well, basically saying, we want to have a simple circuit breaker here that says it may fail only so and so often and it may have, uh, have concurrent connections only so and so many for that destination, for that service. So this now specifies the other side. Until we basically do the same thing like a circuit breaker until we open the circuit on the proxy level already and then just reject the, um, the um, connection immediately without actually calling and um, utilizing that system. So this is how, how that works in th theory. Okay, now it's up and running, and what we can do, let's see if, the, if I still have that in my history, that should have the same, um, sh same IP. Yes, that works. So this is now the IP address of that, um, of that ingress, so we're basically calling the instruments, and what we can also do is um, create new um, instruments with this one. So we have uh, fine gateway timeout, yes. Um, two for no content, we are firing ag um, against this. And then we can do all kind of cool things within Istio. For example, one thing that we get for free is observability. 
we have a monitoring um, dashboard that is included. Um, this is Grafana in Istio clusters that show us, for example, um, how our um, system is utilized here. Um, and also, uh, we have a few, a few other um, things that we, can, that we can monitor within Istio. And here, let me just uh, briefly do one thing. Um, we add, actually, a Makerbot delay that I, that I deleted before um, again. So basically, you saw that now it's up and running. And what we can also inject this kind of faults, for example, saying, please, for 100% of the time, take one and a half seconds longer, just because, in order to test our resiliency. And also, we know that we defined a timeout in the first system. And this is now the reason why we have, for that, a gateway timeout now, immediately, um, without waiting that one and a half seconds. Why? Because our default route says, well, one and a half seconds is too long. We only have one second. That is one example how we can add this. Again, that example that is running right now was the basic Java Enterprise example without our extensions. So that is just basic Java Enterprise or Java code that calls the HTTP connection. All of the resiliency approaches, circuit breakers, HTTP timeouts, are added by our service mesh technology then. And uh, these are a few examples what you can do and what you should do in order to run the Java Enterprise examples more res resiliently. Having that said, thank you very much for your attention.